Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, third virtual session of Robotics Lunch. And today we have Shreyas Kosik from University of Michigan. Um, he's a PhD student at, uh, at the Mechanical Engineering Department working with uh, Professor Ram Vasudevan. Uh, he's working on safety and today he's going to be talking about safe robot motion planning via reachability analysis. Cool. So hopefully everyone can hear me and see the slides. If not, uh, just shout. And I mentioned earlier, feel free to unmute yourselves to ask questions. I don't mind being interrupted, um, but I, I don't usually see the chat as quickly as I'll hear a question. So hi everyone, I'm Shreyas. And the reason I'm here, the reason I do robotics is to get robots to operate in cluttered environments with humans, potentially around dangerous materials like knives or hot oil, and to take on jobs that humans don't want to necessarily do because of the danger involved. But I believe that before we can put robots out into the world, they really need to be safe. We need to specify mathematically and then verify that they are safe. One way to stay safe is what we're all doing, which is to stay home but that can be quite conservative. And we want our robots to actually be able to go out and accomplish tasks. So the trick is to balance safety and conservatism. I've approached this with the following, essentially two halves of my work. One is enforcing safety guarantees, and then the other is enabling real-time trajectory planning. I've done this on a variety of robots, such as wheeled robots, a quadrotor drone, and most recently a robotic manipulator. So some of you may be familiar with the Fetch platform. And I'll show videos of all three of these robots as we go uh, through the talk. To enable safety guarantees, I've spent a lot of time thinking about choosing the right dynamic models to represent the robots, and then using sums of squares or zonotope reachability analysis to enable generating constraints for real-time safe planning. To enable these constraints to be used in real time, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the right way to represent obstacles, uh, one of which is a, a discretization, and then different ways to solve a nonlinear trajectory optimization program at runtime to make it fast enough that it actually can be solved. The umbrella under which all of this work falls is called reachability-based trajectory design, which is the trajectory planning method I've been developing over the past five years of my PhD. And since I can't talk about all of this today, I'll just focus on zonotope reachability and how it applies to drones, which are a good go-between. It shares a lot of the math with the wheeled robots and the manipulators. And if I have time, I'll go through how that applies to manipulators as well. Before diving in, I'll give you a little preview of what this method looks like. So here we have a fetch robot uh, starting out under a table, and it's trying to get above the table, where if you were to solve this type of prog uh, program with an arbitrary the regular numerical optimization solver, you might converge to an infeasible result where the arm just goes through the table. And then, and then collision checking will tell you, okay, this is not safe. Instead, our approach is to use receding horizon planning. And I'll, I'll show this, this approach in the video. What you'll see here in the top right is what the arm sees. So the arm itself is in blue. And then we're computing reachable sets of everywhere that the arm could reach in workspace, given a, a choice of trajectory, which is shown as this gray blob surrounding the arm. It's trying to get to the goal in green. And then in a receding horizon way, we're seeding our planner with waypoints, uh, very coarsely generated waypoints. And in particular, these waypoints are in collision often. So we deliberately wrote bad waypoints to see that we can still enforce safety, even though a higher level planner is telling our trajectory planner to do something unsafe. So here you'll see the arm trying to track these bad waypoints, and it's moving around, meaning it's finding, tra finding trajectories quickly and it's live. But those trajectories are basically getting as close to being inside of collision as possible without actually colliding. As soon as after about 30 seconds, we let it switch to better waypoints and it's immediately able to get over the table without crashing. The idea is we can enforce safety on top of an inherently unsafe high-level planner. And I'll discuss what I mean by high-level planner shortly. In a background of what RTD, or reachability-based trajectory design, is. The context of RTD, again, is receding horizon planning. So imagine we have our drone, maybe some obstacles, and a desired global goal location. Since a drone's sensing capability is limited, or really any robot, it can't sense everything around it, the strategy is to plan a short trajectory, and then while executing it, plan our next short trajectory. So the sensor horizon is receding away from the robot. 
If we can successfully string together such trajectory plans, we can reach the goal without crashing. But we have to compensate for tracking error. This arises from the fact that our high fidelity model describing the robot accurately is often too complex to plan with in real time. So we use a simplified model to do online real time planning. Compensating for tracking error is necessary to say something about safety. There's a few different ways to do that. And the way I like to think about it is to break planning into a hierarchy. At the top level, a high level planner typically performs something like a graph search. So this is what was generating those intermediate waypoints you saw earlier. And in many ways can ignore or greatly simplify the dynamics of the robot to quickly find plans. The output of the high level planner is passed to a trajectory planner, which is able to then bring the more accurate dynamics of the robot into play and generate a dynamically feasible but much shorter trajectory plan that is then tracked by a tracking controller. One way to start to think about safety at the high level planning level is to use temporal logic. So actually this is some of Dorsa's work, uh, <laughs> I believe. The idea here is suppose I specify a goal, maybe there's obstacles and I can create a specification phi here where I'll eventually get to my goal and I won't intersect any obstacles. In a receding horizon way, you can turn this into something very similar to a trajectory optimization program and come up with a discretized sequence of points. There is a trade-off here though. To make it work in real time, you often have to use a really simplified model of the robot or for a more accurate model, you have to pre-compute these plans offline. So you may not be able to respond to an arbitrary scenario. To avoid having to do that um, type of trade-off, one way to approach things is to say at the tracking controller level, I'm gonna let the high level planner and trajectory planner do whatever they want. And then I'm gonna be a safe controller. Fast track, maybe some of you are familiar with this, uh, this work out of UC Berkeley. And I know maybe that's dangerous to mention at a Stanford talk, but that's okay. Uh, the idea with this method is to let a planning model do whatever it wants. So maybe that will trace out this cone as time goes to infinity of possible plans for the robot. And then compute level sets of a value function in the space of tracking error shown here on the left. This is done offline with the reachability analysis. And then at runtime, you choose one of those level sets, uh, or in, in this case, a contour of tracking error and use that amount of tracking error to buffer obstacles. Then no matter what your planning model does, your real robot shouldn't crash. While this is effective at saying something very strong about safety, it requires treating your higher level planners as a disturbance. So it can introduce a lot of conservatism that can make it really hard for a robot to navigate through an arbitrary scenario. Consequently, my work, RTD, is a trajectory planner that balances this need to enforce safety, so it has to obey the dynamics of the robot, with the desire to reduce conservatism. That is to say, we need to track plans generated by a high level planner safely, but we don't want to treat our planner as a disturbance. RTD generates safe plans that incorporate tracking error, so we obey the dynamics of the robot, but this tracking error is trajectory dependent. We're not treating things as a disturbance, our planner and our robot are working together. And if you take nothing else away from this talk, the idea is that this RTD approach enables safe real-time trajectory planning. Before diving into the method, I'll show you a little bit of what it looks like. So here you'll see in the top left, this is what the robot is seeing. And we're talking about this little rover, or it's a four-wheel drive car. Here's a GoPro mounted on the rover. And the robot is shown as a blue rectangle. Uh, I think you can see my cursor, yeah. The robot is shown as a blue rectangle. It's reachable set and I'll explain what that is, or the current trajectory plan is shown as a green contour, and it's trying to get to this black intermediate waypoint. Over many such uh, trials, which we randomly generated, we had no collisions. And uh, to emphasize the randomness here, my lab mate Sean will come and pick one of the boxes. So I'll also point out that the robot is rediscovering the world every time. So it's, it's doing uh, mapping in real time. It, we don't tell it what the obstacles are a priori. Okay, so what is this RTD thing and how does it work? Since I'll focus on drones, I'll use this drone cartoon, but please understand that anything I show as a cartoon does translate rigorously to math. The way RTD works is by specifying a space of parameterized trajectories shown here on the left. And then on the right is the drone in its workspace. The idea is a point on the left corresponds to a short trajectory plan on the right. And I'll explain what these parameters look like uh, in a little bit. Since we have tracking error, 
the goal is to compute a reachable set for every such trajectory parameter on the left. What I mean is, instead of doing it for just one parameter, we'll do it for a continuum of trajectory parameters, and we call that object the forward reachable set, which should include the motion of the robot and tracking error for every one of these trajectories. This is done in an offline reachability analysis, and then at runtime, when obstacles appear, we intersect them with the workspace reachable set and project them into the parameter space. In other words, we compute parameter space obstacles, which I'll denote KU for unsafe. Then given an arbitrary cost function, such as reaching a goal location, we solve a trajectory optimization program with our decision variable in the parameter space, as opposed to choosing over, for example, discretized trajectories. So this is a way to represent trajectories in continuous time and space and actually enable strict safety guarantees. A feasible solution to this program means that the robot will not crash despite tracking error. So what it looks like on a drone, uh, here's a drone flying through a randomly generated forest-like scenario at up to five meters per second. And over hundreds of such simulations, we had no crashes. That top speed of five meters per second was only chosen due to the model that I pulled off of a, of a well-established drone paper. Since I don't expect you to just believe sim simulation results, we've also started doing this on hardware. So here you'll see this uh, Parrot Mambo micro drone. It weighs about 40 grams, and then we've added motion capture markers to it. And then on the bottom right, you see what the drone sees. So here are all the obstacles, the global goal in green, and then this reachable set is the blue tube of boxes that the drone is going to stay within. You notice that despite significant tracking error, we're actually able to navigate through arbitrary scenarios. Since we don't have an 80 meter long fully instrumented forest to, drive, to fly through, we're just doing this in a, uh, inside of our lab. So actually this camera is sitting on top of my desk. More recently, we've actually gotten this thing flying up to 1.5 meters per second, which is really fast in this tiny space. But the, uh, the idea is that we're able to say something strong about safety. So how does this work? Now I'll go through a, a bit of the underlying math of how this applies to drones. And then I can explain in more detail how it uh, translates to both the car case or wheeled robots and to manipulators. This is joint work with Patrick Holmes and Zafai Lu. And I'll break up this chunk of the talk into an offline modeling portion and then offline reachability analysis on both our simplified planning model and how, how we compensate for tracking error. And then I'll talk about what we do at runtime. We described the drone with a high fidelity model that has states for position, velocity, angular velocity, and a rotation matrix or attitude matrix describing the orientation of the drone in space. And then the dynamics, here we write down the full uh, SE3 rigid body dynamics for the drone. The idea is that planning with these dynamics is really hard. And just to, to be a little more clear, the choices of control input that we would be planning over are thrust and body moment caused by the changes in rotor speeds or the differential in rotor speeds. Because planning with this type of model is really difficult due to its high nonlinearity and coupling between states, we want to use a simplified model, what I'll call a planning model. And this is where the trajectory parameterization comes in. So points in the space on the left correspond to trajectories on the right. I'll denote the dynamics of the simplified model with a little f. And in particular, this model just specifies velocities that are functions of time and parameters. Those velocities we, we take a common approach in drone planning, which is to take coefficients chosen by the trajectory parameters and then have the velocities themselves be a time varying polynomial. And again, I'll describe what these parameters look like shortly. This is useful for real time planning because it's three separate polynomials, one in each workspace dimension. And the idea is that we can generate plans with these types of models really quickly, but those plans can't be tracked perfectly. So what one of those plans looks like, the parameters are something like this. And this is, this is just an example parameterization, but it, I'll, I'll discuss the general case uh, shortly. We choose an initial velocity, an initial acceleration, and a desired velocity at a time t desired along the trajectory as our parameterization. And when it comes to computing tracking error, I'll explain why this is a useful parameterization. The important part is that any parameterization we, check, we choose has to end in a stop. So as we're doing receding horizon planning, we're trying to generate a new trajectory every receding horizon planning iteration. And for some reason, if we can't generate a trajectory in one iteration, 
we need to know that our previous trajectory was safe, so every trajectory should include a fail-safe maneuver. If we can validate that the entire trajectory, including the stopping maneuver, is safe, then we know that we can continue executing that even if we don't find a new plan. Now, the downside here is that this is still a nine-dimensional parameter space on the left, plus three dimensions here. But we can take advantage of the decoupling of the planning model dynamics to actually make this tractable for reachability analysis. Uh, before I go on, are there any questions, any comments, concerns? OK. So how do we do reachability analysis on the planning model and tracking error? To do so, I'll introduce an object called a zonotope. A zonotope is a set in Euclidean space that I'll denote Z, and it's centered at a point C. We then take the convex combination of C with vectors called generators. One is shown here as G1. And in this example, I've just shown three generators, G1 through G3. By multiplying each of those generators by a coefficient beta that is allowed to vary between minus one and one, we trace out this volume that we call a zonotope. This object is useful because it enables us to perform reachability analysis by holding onto a sequence of zonotopes that represent the robot through time. And we can represent it really easily on a computer by holding onto the center and then big G, which is just a concatenation of the generators. So essentially holding onto two arrays parameterizes this zonotope object. Big B here is a multi-dimensional interval of appropriate size to hold onto all of the beta coefficients. So how do zonotopes turn into reachable sets? Imagine for just one trajectory parameter that I specified an initial zonotope, and then here I have my desired uh, trajectory in position space for that parameter. First, I'll take my time interval and then partition it into a bunch of tiny intervals. And the idea is to get one zonotope per interval. We use an open source toolbox called Cora to generate these zonotopes. And I'll also suppose that there are n of these intervals. What this will look like is essentially a tube, which I'll just call a reachable set. And it's represented as a sequence of n zonotopes, zi, where i is this time index. Of course, we don't just do this for one trajectory. We do this for a continuum of trajectory parameters. So we specify an initial zonotope on the robot and over the entire parameter space. And then here, the cartoon version looks like a bunch of boxes. But the idea is that we're computing a sequence of zonotopes in a high dimensional space and that represents the forward reachable set of our planning model. This is done offline, but to, do it, to use it online, we'll need to be able to get a single trajectory out of this collection of every possible trajectory. And it turns out that the zonotope representation allows us to back out the subset corresponding to a single trajectory. I'll call that operation slicing, because you can think of it as taking a high dimensional object and taking a slice through that object and getting just a subset that you care about. The takeaway here, is that our planning model, our simplified model of the robot, is now represented with a sequence of zonotopes. And what we can do then is use this sequence of zonotopes to identify unsafe trajectories. However, we still have to compensate for tracking error, and that's what we'll do now. To understand where the tracking error comes from, let's take a look at one trajectory. And recall that it has the, the dynamics little f that are specifying velocity, or p dot desired, or p's position. We need to essentially subtract these two models from each other to understand tracking error. So to do a tracking error reachability analysis, we actually have to do reachability analysis on all nine parameters, and then this entire model, plus the three dimensions of our planning model, which ends up with time and uh, ends up like a 22 dimensional nonlinear model. And that, that is to say that the tracking error is our position of our robot minus our desired position. Since tracking error, or sorry, since reachability analysis is in general intractable for such high dimensional uh, coupled nonlinear systems, we have to be a bit clever about how we do this reachability analysis. And it turns out that by inspecting these models, we can actually notice that we can sample where the tracking error is worst. So we can choose a finite subset of our entire possible 22 dimensional space and just identify where we have really bad tracking error. That occurs when our initial speed of our robot is maximized. And that's how we'll, we'll turn this, what would previously be an intractable problem of reachability analysis into a more tractable sampling-based reachability analysis. Can I ask a few questions, just clarifications, Sharia? Yes. Um, so, so, so if I understand it correctly, so you're creating the xenotope, like the set of xenotopes offline, right? So yep. 
uh, how actually computationally, like how bad is that? Like, I know it's done offline, but like, is it like, is, can you go above like R9 or is that like a nine like number of uh, dimensions that you can handle? It depends on how, how coupled the nonlinear dynamics are. So mm -hmm. in the case of the planning model, since it's, it's these nine dimensions plus another three for the position, mm -hmm. it's even though it's quite high dimensional, it's actually three uh, four dimensional problems. And each of those is tractable. And then you can, essentially you can catenate the zonotope centers and generators to turn them into higher dimensional zonotopes. I see. So we're, we're a bit clever about our choice of planning model to make it tractable. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that, that choice of um, zonotope representation doesn't make it tractable for the tracking error reachability that we'll do next. So there we have to say, okay, where does tracking error occur? And look at the, uh, look at the underlying dynamics of the high fidelity model. So, so that's exactly what this, this lemma is, is doing. It's saying, okay, for this high fidelity model, we can find where the tracking error is maximized, but this is, this is independent of the zonotope representation. I see, and there's a kind of like a, uh, can you give an intuition of like why the tracking error is maximized when initial speed is maximized? Yep, so commonly for drones, the rotational dynamics are much faster than the translation dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a, a working assumption in drone planning. And so what this means is you can, more or less point your thrust vector very quickly wherever you want. And we find in practice that this is true. So what you can think of is that the drone points its thrust vector in the right direction for whatever the desired speed is, and then it attempts to accelerate towards that desired, sorry, desired velocity. And then the error is caused by your initial velocity mismatching with your desired velocity. So the larger that mismatch, the more tracking error you'll have. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, and I, I do actually have backup slides on that that I'm happy to show uh, more can, at the yeah, end of the talk. Uh, yeah, we can do it uh, later. Um, and yeah, one last just like compare uh, question. So, um, so I haven't looked at like these stuff for in a while, but like how uh, does this relate to like some of the older work around like LQR trees and those types of reach like funnels and having like yeah, funnels like on top of building on top of each other and doing reachability analysis of that form. Because it really reminded me of funnels, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's exactly where you should be thinking. So the funnel libraries uh, from Russ Tedrake and Ani Majumdar mm -hmm. pre-specifies a finite set a priori because computing each funnel takes a long time. And in our case, um, actually the planning model reachability for us, because we use this decoupled model, only mm -hmm. takes about a second offline. I see, I see. Uh, but then the tracking error reachability that I'll talk about next, because we're sampling in a high dimensional space, this takes uh, like about an hour and a half. Um, in the worst case. So it's it's not tractable for online planning. But the big difference between what we're doing, what the funnel libraries are doing, is that we are using this continuum of trajectories. So in some sense, we have a lot more choices of trajectory plans at runtime because mm -hmm. we're choosing from this continuum. Um, the the other thing that we're doing is funnel libraries will, will compute the feedback controller for you. Like mm -hmm. you said, the LQR tree is doing that it's finding the LQR controller for each desired trajectory. Mm -hmm. Whereas what we're doing is we're saying, okay, the user can tune your feedback controller however you like, and as long as it obeys certain uh, continuity assumptions, so it's like Lipschitz continuous in the closed loop dynamics, then you can just say, what is my tracking error? Like how bad am I doing? As opposed to saying compute with reachability analysis as a feedback controller. So this, this gives the user more flexibility in how they want to design their own controller. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. That, okay. Yeah, so how are we actually going to make this thing tractable? Well, we'll look at the parameterization and notice that we've cleverly parameterized the initial velocity. So we can actually sample in this parameter space um, and, and estimate our tracking error as a function of our initial velocity by sampling our desired velocity. So we've taken a 22 dimensional thing and then used the fact that we can rapidly point our acceleration vector where we want it to be and then sample in a six dimensional space, which is much more tractable. And I'll build up that algorithm again in cartoon form, but every cartoon here turns into rigorous math. So imagine that this drone has a, a sphere of possible velocities it could achieve, and we'll build up an algorithm to sample for the tracking error. We'll begin by over approximating all possible velocities with a big box, and I'll denote that like a multi-dimensional interval type object that we saw earlier. And here, this abusive notation just means we're going to sample the corners of this box, meaning a point that looks like this. And this is a possible initial velocity. 
we know from our parameterization that we're allowed to choose a, a desired velocity. So if we assume a maximum acceleration that we're allowed to command, then we'll have some sort of sphere of possible choices of velocity. And then we can make that uh, an over approximation with a box. And the reason to over approximate this is that we want worst case scenario tracking error and we want a conservative estimate of it. Now we have our samples of desired velocity and initial velocity, where that is the corners of this box corresponding to the corner of this initial velocity box. For each of those samples, these dots on the right, we'll actually compute the tracking error by running forward our dynamics and then save a zonotope collection. And I'll, I'll show you what this zonotope collection looks like next. But the idea is that uh, we'll, we'll save the tracking error by over approximating it with a, a sequence of boxes in the workspace. So what that looks like for a single trajectory, let, let's assume that we have some exaggerated tracking error for this one trajectory. What we can do for that sample is essentially compute a sequence of these red boxes representing the tracking error. And that's the object I'm denoting E sub I, E for error, and then I to tell you that it corresponds to the short time intervals over which we computed our planning model reachable set. To remind you what that looks like, for this trajectory, that might look something like this. So again, this is a sequence of zonotopes denoted ZI. And then if we add these zonotopes together, this actually cont contains the drone's position at this time. The, the utility of this is that now we can say something strong about the, the reachable set containing the motion of the actual robot. And I'll also point out that this addition of zonotopes is really easy to implement um, at runtime. Of course, to do this for the entire velocity box would be really, really conservative. So we can chop up this velocity box into many small uh, partitions and then run this sampling algorithm for each little box of initial possible velocities. So this is the reachability analysis offline that I said takes around an hour to an hour and a half for a common drone model. We can then prove, and, and really the takeaway here is that is this uh, expression that the position of the drone P lies inside the zonotope that we computed with the planning model, plus the tracking error zonotope, which is just a function of our initial velocity. And this is an operation that I'll call stacking. In, in case I am able to get through the manipulator stuff, this idea of stacking will become important. But the idea is that you can just add zonotopes together and then hold on to a reachable set of a much more complex model because you've uh, computed these zonotopes for so a simpler model. Okay, the big takeaway here is that we now have a reachable set that holds onto the motion of our actual drone. We've done this offline and we can now use this object for online planning. Uh, are there any more questions about the offline reachability analysis? Okay, so what do we do at runtime? The first step is to identify obstacles in the parameter space in each receding horizon planning iteration. So when obstacles appear, we want to map them to this set KU for unsafe. And to show how that works, I'll just look at a single time slice of our zonotope reachable set. Recall that that's the zonotope for the planning model, the simplified model of the drone, plus our error to, comp to compensate for the complex model of the drone. And I'll denote that with a hat to remind you that error is included. I'll also assume that obstacles can be represented by zonotopes, which is reasonable, for example, if I have a, an oct tree or a voxel grid. The question we want to ask then is, do these objects, these zonotopes, have non-empty intersection? I'll start gathering reminder terms of math on the left and then working the math on the right. And remember that we can represent our zonotope as a center plus a generator matrix times an interval, where B again is this multidimensional interval from minus one to one and appropriate dimensions. We can do our obstacle the same way by assumption. So to check for intersection, we can set these two objects equal to each other and then turn one of those intervals into an unknown. We can then solve, and, and we show formally that we can actually solve for this interval in the paper, and we'll get some multidimensional interval that doesn't necessarily overlap minus one to one. So the question is, do these two intervals overlap? And we can show that if there exist unsafe trajectory parameters here on the left, then in, in fact, these two intervals do overlap. In other words, if there exist unsafe trajectories, then our reachable set has non-empty intersection with our obstacle. We formalize that. So there exist uh, unsafe trajectory parameters. There exist unsafe choices of motion plans for the drone. That implies that these intervals have non-empty intersection. 
And because we have everything represented as intervals or effectively as polytopes, checking if a point in our parameter space is unsafe is equivalent to taking uh, a maximum of a collection of linear constraints. The reason this matters is that we're using these obstacle representations in the parameter space as constraints for online trajectory optimization. So we need to be able to evaluate constraints and their gradients really quickly. While we don't have linear constraints, we have the next best thing, which is collections of linear constraints in a nonlinear max or min function. So this is like checking if a point lies outside of a polytope. This makes real-time planning over the space of trajectory parameters tractable. So what does one trajectory optimization um, iteration look like? Suppose our drone is already flying along this trajectory with an initial acceleration and initial velocity. And our goal then is to decide on its next desired velocity. We'll solve this program that I showed you earlier for some arbitrary cost. And then the constraint is don't be inside the unsafe set for which a feasible solution is certainly not in collision for the simplified model plus tracking error. Then because each trajectory ends in a stopping maneuver, if we assume there exists a safe trajectory for the first planning iteration, then the robot will never crash. This is the big takeaway. We've gone from a, a really complex high fidelity model of our robot uh, through reachability analysis in a way that enables making strict safety guarantees for runtime trajectory optimization. So what does it look like? I'll show a couple more videos. Here's the same scenario from earlier and we're flying in the opposite direction. You can see again, the reachable set is this blue tube of zonotopes. So that is the current slice of the high dimensional reachable set. And then the goal is just to go through this goal region, not to stop inside of it. We've, we've created a whole bunch of different static obstacle gauntlets so far and had no crashes, despite significant tracking error in, in some cases. I'll also point out for this particular one, I tried to fly the drone manually and I crashed it twice and so I stopped. Um, it's actually quite a hard scenario to fly quickly through this. We've also started doing this in dynamic environments. So here my lab mates, Shannon and Patrick bravely volunteered. And then you'll see the drone really aggressively plan towards them. Uh, we surrounded the humans with one meter by one meter boxes. So uh, that avoids any of the aerodynamic effects caused by following a human closely. But I'll show you that that is really one of the key avenues of future work that I'm looking into. One, actually, sorry, one quick question on uh, the dynamics. So, so um, then you have dynamics obstacles. Um, are you, so, so, does, so, so, so are you giving any uh, relationships between like, let's say tracking error and uh, the velocity or like the trajectory of the dynamics obstacle? So how does that take in, like, like yeah, what type of dynamics obstacles does this, does this actually work with? If this assumes a prediction. So I'm only dealing with the planning part, not the prediction part. And I, I'm mm -hmm. assuming that I have a prediction of each obstacle that is conservative mm -hmm. and is of the duration of, my, of each trajectory. So each trajectory I plan is, is pretty short, about one and a half seconds. So it's mm -hmm. reasonable to say, okay, I could take a, a, a good guess at where a human is going to be in one and a half seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the assumption that I require. So it's like, hey, this drone is able to predict the moving things in its environment. And actually we are, one of my lab mates, Cyrus is working on, uh, he, he's recently developed a way to do that prediction. So we're gonna try and plug that into this framework where here I, I pre-specified the predictions. Oh, oh, I want to show you the other part of the video. So the other big part of future work that is not addressed is when we have a much smaller representation of our obstacle. So here I'll show you, we have this rover and it's really small. And it turns out that because it's really small, it produces a lot of wake but we get really close to it, and then that wake pulls our drone out of the reachable set. In other words, we actually can't say something about safety when we have aerodynamic interactions with our obstacles yet. So that's one thing I think is actually tractable with this approach because we're able to incorporate um, accelerations as disturbances in the reachable set. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm looking into doing next is taking these environmental accelerations, for example, produced by the wake of a dynamic obstacle, and then adding it to the reachable set on the fly. To, to actually do that, I have yet to work through the math, but we'll see. So I actually do have a bit of time to go through the manipulator uh, math. And, and, and you'll notice that it's actually really similar in many ways to the drone. We do still an offline modeling and then an offline reachability computation. But then at runtime, since our, our manipulator is not a single rigid body, it's a collection of rigid bodies, we have to compose a reachable set 
to compensate for the initial joint angles and the initial joint velocities. Then we'll perform online planning as we saw before. So let's, well, let me go through this stuff quickly too. I think hopefully you'll find it interesting. I'll begin by giving you an example of what these trajectories look like in joint angle space. So recall for the drone, we parameterize initial velocity. And similarly, we'll do that for the arm. We'll parameterize the initial velocity of each joint. But then here, we'll also uh, parameterize a commanded acceleration. And, and for the ith joint, that'll look something like this in the velocity space. So we begin from an initial velocity, and we command a desired acceleration. And then as we saw with the drone, after some amount of time, we have to break to a stop. This particular amount of time is how long we have in each receding horizon iteration to generate a new plan. That is to say, if we can't generate a new plan, we continue the previous trajectory and break to a stop. Now, analyzing the trajectories in configuration space is useful because things look very linear, but it doesn't translate to the swept volumes in workspace that we care about for collision avoidance. So instead, we'll look at trajectories evolving on the unit circle. In particular, the x-axis here is the cosine of the ith joint and the sine of the ith joint. And we'll assume that every trajectory begins at this point one, zero. This is because we can rotate around the unit circle at runtime to compensate for different initial joint angles. Then a point in the parameter space is a short trajectory that breaks to a stop along the unit circle. As we saw earlier, we represent these types of parameterized trajectories for a continuum of trajectory parameters. And then here, we'll represent it as a sector on the unit circle. Now, this is the type of reachable set object we compute offline for the, for the manipulator arm. And while it doesn't immediately look similar to what we did for the drone, I'll show you how we represent it. First, let me make this axis S and C just to simplify notation. And I'll call this object the joint reachable set or JRS. I'll denote this script JI. So if you take nothing else away, just know that this J object is the joint reachable set. And then we start out by specifying a zonotope at our initial condition. And then again, we use that open source toolbox Cora with the partition of time and get a sequence of zonotopes over approximating every sine and cosine achieved by our ith joint in this uh, unit circle space. Much like we had for the drone, we have a sequence of zonotopes, but now it's indexed by time, where here I'm abusing notation a bit, but it's indexed by these time intervals and by the ith joint. So we have a copy of this reachable set for each joint. This actually computes really fast, so in under a second offline, but we can use it at runtime to assemble a reachable set of, a, of the full nonlinear arm uh, in milliseconds, which is a big result because usually computing a reachable set for an arm over a continuum of trajectories is really, really challenging. How do we do this composition at runtime? Let's just look at the first link, and it has its parameter space K1. We'll begin with that slicing operation I showed you earlier. So we'll slice by the initial velocity and then compute the swept volume for all of these trajectory parameters. We'll do the same for the second link. So we slice by the initial velocities and then get the swept volume. We slice for the third link and get the swept volume. These slicing operations on the left are to specify the initial velocity and joint angle. And then these stacking operations, so the same way that we added tracking error to our reachable set, is how we actually add reachable sets to each other to get a reachable set of the entire manipulator. This is really powerful because we're not limited then by the number of degrees of freedom of the manipulator. Oh, pardon me, <laughs> my throat is drying out a little bit. Okay, are there any questions at this point or shall I proceed into the, a bit more of the theory? Okay. So how, do, how does this actually look uh, mathematically? Remember we have our joint reachable set, script J, defined over the sines and cosines of the joint angle. The first thing we do is slice, and here I've collapsed all the reachable sets for all of the joints into one. And then since we actually care about the swept volume of the links, we'll reshape these reachable sets from the sines and cosines into a set of rotation matrices, script R here. The idea is that we keep around the trajectory parameters, but then each element of this set on the left is actually a rotation matrix. And it turns out that since zonotopes are represented in Euclidean space, and we're just over approximating um, vectors in Euclidean space, you can still over approximate matrices. That's just a reshaping of a zonotope. Now to get the swept volume of the first link, 
Again, we'll slice and then take this link volume V1 and multiply it by every element of this set. What this multiplication looks like is surprisingly able to essentially still get a sequence of zonotope-like objects. So I'm, I'm going to say that they're zonotopes, but just know that they're, they're very closely related. And this is possible because we've just held onto a sequence of zonotopes and then multiplied it by a volume also represented as a zonotope. Uh, hopefully you're not sick of me saying the word zonotope over and over. <laughs> All right, so here we'll do the same thing for our second link. We'll slice by our initial condition. And then if we were to just naively multiply every rotation matrix by the link volume, we would be missing translation and rotation due to that interaction with the first link. So this is where the stacking operation of adding our reachable sets together becomes very important. In particular, let's consider what happens to the joint location where these two links are attached. If I look at the way that the first link rotation matrices are applied to this joint location, I end up with a reachable set that is accounting for translation of my second link. And then I can use the stacking operation to compensate for my rotation volume and translation volume together producing a swept volume for all of my trajectory parameters for my entire second link. So mathematically, this object is the product of all the, the predecessor rotation matrices times my new link volume, plus this translation volume caused by the motion of my previous link uh, joint location. And we keep around all the trajectory parameters because this volume that we've stacked holds on to everywhere the arm could reach under this continuum of trajectories. As we saw before, we can rinse and repeat for the third link and get another stacked reachable set. So this is, this is what it looks like mathematically, but what are we actually doing to the zonotopes to make this possible? It turns out that slicing is actually really easy to implement. It means just fixing coefficient values. So recall that these beta i or beta one, two, three are varying between minus one and one in our cartoon zonotope. Uh, slicing is equivalent to fixing uh, any subset of these betas to uh, particular values in this set. So here, a Z slice is a zonotope again, but the center has shifted and now it has less generators. And visually, this is why we're calling it slicing. Similarly, stacking is just the set addition or Minkowski sum of zonotopes. And that in practice is the addition of centers and then the concatenation of generators. So both of these operations are really quick to implement at runtime and they're entirely parallelizable. The takeaway here is now we have a reachable set with a mixed offline and online reachability analysis finished for our arm. And we can use this reachable set just like with the drone for online trajectory optimization. So the first thing is we want to slice our parameter space, stack our reachable set, and then as we saw with the drone, intersect the reachable set with our obstacles that we've detected to get the unsafe parameters in this parameter space. Then suppose that we have an arbitrary cost function like reaching this green goal location. We'll solve the same program we saw earlier. So minimize over K an arbitrary cost and be safe. The beautiful part about this is that due to our zonotope representation, we can slice in the other direction. So once we find an optimal solution here, we can slice again to back out the swept volume that we know is collision free for our current trajectory. And we do this in a receding horizon way over and over and over, which shows that this operation of generating a reachable set for the arm is actually fast enough to do at runtime. Now I showed you this example earlier where we gave the arm really bad waypoints and it got to the goal. So here's an example where we do much better job because we give it good intermediate waypoints. The idea is that we give it really coarse waypoints. So these are not generated necessarily by a, a planner that knows anything about the dynamics of the arm. But when we have better waypoints, and very few of them, in this case, I think only three between the bottom shelf and the top shelf, RTD, the proposed method, is able to rapidly follow those waypoints and get around these very thin obstacles that are traditionally challenging to deal with for manipulator trajectory planning. Further, since we're doing a receding horizon framework, we're able to respond to a changing environment. So here, my advisor bravely donated a glass phase, which I covered in mocap markers, and we're able to break to a stop and then start to plan around it. And then I sped up at the end just because it's hard to tell in these videos because of the motion um, in the direction of the camera that the arm is actually moving fast enough to really hurt you. So this is a, a testament to, to say that, hey, we actually believe in this method. That, that covers everything mathematically. And, and I hope you 
take the following things away from this talk. Part of the challenge in motion planning is that you want to plan really quickly with a simple model and generate a high level plan, but you have to track it safely. But then you don't want to treat that planner as a disturbance to enforce safety because you don't want things to be so conservative, they never do anything. So just as we saw before, we can incorporate tracking error and we can make that tracking error dependent on our trajectory choice to reduce conservatism. So again, if you take nothing else away, just know that RTD, this method I've spent a few years developing, is a way to do safe real-time trajectory planning. And now for some more videos. <laughs> so here's a car driving up to 35 miles per hour using the high fidelity car sim simulator. And the idea is that we don't code in anything like lane changes or slowing down for corners explicitly, but because those are what is mathematically safe that we can identify at runtime, the car will do this. Essentially, we're, we're naturally discovering the right thing to do in this type of environment by enforcing safety as a hard constraint in real time. Again, if we provide our robot with uh, predictions of obstacles, so here we have enforced virtual obstacles for this Segway robot, then we're able to plan with respect to them because we're considering the entire time bearing trajectory in continuous time. The tricky part here is safety is impossible to necessarily certify in a dynamic environment when other people can crash into you. But here we can say that we're not at fault in a collision where faults can be specified, uh, for example, by like traffic laws. And finally, because I do trust this thing, I actually sat in this golf cart. So this is me running RTD on my laptop and the car is driving us, oh, sorry, wrong button. The car is driving us through these big, heavy concrete planters that would be very painful and expensive to hit. I think the exciting part about this is that the pedestrians who could see that none of, neither of us had our hands on the steering wheel just didn't care at all. They were just walking around as though autonomy is totally expected and normal. So that's uh, encouraging for the future. So that's everything I have for y'all, uh, but I'm happy to answer questions and uh, spend more time chatting. I have the whole afternoon free to chat. I'd like to point out this is not a solo effort by any means. I've had plenty of people in my lab all working on this on these various projects. And then we've been blessed with a bunch of funding to help us you know, buy these robots. We also have a whole bunch of open source code available online. So this includes the sum to squares reachability in the first two GitHub links, and then Zonotope reachability in these next two. And then we've actually implemented uh, that fast track planner I mentioned earlier in case you wanna play with some of the stuff from Berkeley. So that concludes everything that I had to uh, talk about, but I'm happy to take questions or discuss things in more detail. Thanks. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shiryas. Yeah, thanks. Does anyone have, have questions or anything you're curious about? Hey, Shiryas, hey. it's John. Um, hey, what's up? I'm just, uh, yeah, thank you for joining us at Stanford. It was great to meet you at uh, American Controls Conference, and it's uh, really cool to see uh, the progress that you've made since your presentation there. And uh, I loved your videos of the of the experiments. It's like really, like the the math definitely goes over my head as a knuckle dragging mechanical engineer, but <laughs> um, but the the visualizations you use during the experiments are are very neat. Thanks so much. That's very kind. That's really kind of you. Also, I'm, I'm glad you could make it to this talk. Uh, this is, this is, I'm very proud of this stuff. It's been a lot of fun to work on. And uh, hopefully the code is easy to use. Please let me know if anybody tries it and there's bugs. Uh, <laughs> I'm usually pretty quick about fixing them. So, so what is next for you? Yes, like what is, so you mentioned a few next directions you want to look at, but yep. uh, can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, I might actually have that specifically in backup slides, just because I really like visualizing these things. Oh, nope, I did not. Okay, well, one, one idea is that these zonotope reachable sets are really, really model dependent, but we don't always know a model. So for this drone in particular, the hardware drone, we had to fit a model with nonlinear system identification, and that model is pretty wrong after about a second of flight. I think though that because that the way we've we've created this tracking error reachability analysis is actually essentially saving a lookup table and editing that lookup table on the fly is really quick and easy to do. 
So instead of, instead of doing all of this offline reachability and then presenting like the robot is actually going to be that exact model forever, we can start to adjust the reachable set at runtime by measuring statistical, uh, like, like using statistical techniques to measure our flight data or, or really for any robot. A really good example would be uh, to, to estimate tire friction online and then adjust the reachable set at runtime. So, so you lose a safety guarantee, but you can say something about uh, a confidence interval or a probabilistic guarantee of collision avoidance by using this particular representation that I've spent a lot of time developing to uh, essentially do some, some rigorous statistical learning at runtime of the model of your robot. Uh, that, that's, that's one really powerful direction. The other thing I'm really curious about is I've ignored perception for this whole time, but I've spent a lot of time specifying the right types of obstacle representations that I need as a controls engineer to do safe control. So the next thing I'm really curious about doing is uh, starting from the SLAM perspective, because I'm able to say, okay, I can generate safe trajectories. Let me map the world safely. But the type of representation of the map that I need is now very clear from the controls perspective. So um, controls influenced SLAM is something I'm, I'm starting to look into. I'm not an expert by any means in the perception literature, but I think that that's a natural extension of taking these reachability ideas and then using them to specify the representations we need for safe control. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. The other kind of like two directions that comes to mind is like here you are basing like everything like on the trajectory optimization using these reachability analysis type of techniques, right? But like, like it's not clear everyone necessarily uses trajectory optimization either, right? Like so sometimes people use sampling based methods or more le reinforcement learning type techniques. Are those also like directions that you think some of these ideas could be applied to? Like if you were to use a sampling yep. based planner or an RL so planner? I will point out that the way that we generate waypoints in this work has always has been sampling based. So the idea okay. is that RTD is a way to add a safety layer on top of an RRT. Mm -hmm. and, and pretty much every video I showed, we're actually- Oh, there was an RRT planner. planner. Yeah, okay. yeah, so that's, so the cool part is that by, we allow the RRT to totally ignore the dynamics of the robot. Mm -hmm. And so it can run really fast and come up with good waypoints really fast. Mm -hmm. But then we enforce safety by doing trajectory optimization to track those waypoints. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, so Simon here, um, I'll point out, maybe you can see the cursor. He's working on right now with me kind of floating in the background is using these reachable sets to do reinforcement learning to get the robot to discover what are the right waypoints. But mm -hmm. because well, let's assume that the model is correct, we can say something really strong about safety with respect to that model. Mm -hmm. And then the robot can essentially play. So we're using reinforcement learning to, to back out the best waypoints in arbitrary scenarios. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's, that's where I think the safety aspect comes in. Yeah. On the other yeah. yeah. And, and so that's something I'm actually very eager to learn about next because I have done little, little work in reinforcement learning. So I think to become a, a complete roboticist, I need to at least know that literature. And that's something I'm looking into next. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, does anyone else have questions or comments? Anything you're curious about? Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, it was a really nice talk, by the way. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, so, uh, you mentioned that you have all the trajectories ending at rest uh, to ensure safety. I'm curious about uh, whether this becomes a problem when you consider uh, moving at higher velocities or whether uh, you have a long enough time horizon on the trajectory that it's not really an issue. So we require the time horizon of each trajectory plan to be long enough for that to be possible, but that really only works for dynamic scenario, uh, for static scenarios, and doesn't make sense, for example, in highway uh, driving, right? Because you would need something like a seven second long trajectory and that would be a really uncomfortable braking maneuver. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think going to the probabilistic reachable sets that I mentioned kind of at the, at the beginning of this slide, it would be really useful in the sense that I don't need to know that I'm perfectly safe for this entire horizon because I can, I can say with some certainty that I'm going to find another trajectory that isn't me breaking suddenly to a stop. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing though that this parameterized approach lets you do is parameterize things like lane changes. So we can always hold on to a, a maneuver that's pulling over onto the shoulder, assuming a shoulder exists. And, and that's, that's more along the lines of what I mentioned about fault. So the idea is maybe it is not allowed to break to a stop on the highway. And certainly your point is, is very true that like 
I'll need a really long time horizon of prediction to do something like breaking to the stop on a uh, breaking to a stop on the highway. But if I start to incorporate things like local law into what it means to be safe, I can use the trajectory parameterization to to pre-specify safe maneuvers uh, with respect to like local law. Mm -hmm. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, a really good example, actually, if, you, if you're familiar with Andrea Chensi's work, he's at ETH Zurich and working with Aptiv, and he has a thing called a rule book, where essentially it's a way to like guide, uh, as far as I know, it, it really is useful for guiding how an RRT will explore the world for autonomous driving, but he enforces rules mathematically, such as like, it's okay to go into the opposing traffic lane if there's like an emergency in my lane. So you can soften certain constraints that would be hard collision avoidance constraints, and then that type of soft constraint can be directly incorporated into my RTD framework as the cost function, because we don't care what the cost function is at runtime. So, so then that's something for, if you're curious about to explore. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank cool. you, Shriya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for your time, everyone. I, I hope that was uh, exciting and interesting. <laughs> thanks.